I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture about the case NLRB, or National Labor Relations Board, versus Bell Aerospace. This is a 1974 decision from the United States Supreme Court about rulemaking through adjudication. Now, for my students, this is an important note case in my administrative law case book that I use in my course, and it's actually one of the main cases in the casebook I use for statutory interpretation and regulation or leg rig. So let's look at what happens in this case. So the question in this case, the legal question that, that the opinions are going to be focused on is whether these buyers at um, Bell Aerospace facility had the right to unionize. And so these are purchasers or procurement managers who order equipment and supplies or raw materials for this manufacturing plant or parts that they use, component parts to make airplanes and airplane um, pieces. And under the National Labor Relations Act, that's our operative statute in this case, uh, the answer to this question depended on whether the purchasers were managerial employees. So under the act, managerial employees are not allowed to unionize, but other employees usually can. And there's a variety of policy reasons for this, but it, the question is whether they are managers or not. And in this case at the ALJ or administrative law judge or uh, he, stage through an agency adjudication, the NLRB had concluded that the Bell Aerospace buyers weren't not managerial employees. So that meant that they could um, unionize. This note marked a change in the agency's uh, policy position on this particular point or issue. Now, just to clarify why the agency would have been of two minds about this, uh, these purchasers are office workers, right? So they you know, work at a desk and um, make phone calls, look at spreadsheets and things like that. And they're not the, the manual laborers in the fac factory. They're not running machinery or uh, driving forklifts or, or things like that. And so their work environment might make them look like they're working with the management team a lot. So it, it's not hard to see why some people would have called them um, managers or managerial employees before this. But the NLRB has a way of defining that that relates to some things like um, the way your hours are compensated and whether you supervise other employees and so forth. So let's keep going. This is really about a procedural question, not about the substance of the case. And so the Second Circuit Court of Appeals had held that although the National Labor Relations Board could, because of its enabling statute, determine that certain types of buyers at companies were not managerial employees, it could do so only by invoking its rulemaking procedures, not via an agency adjudication. Uh, some case books, like the one I use for statutory interpretation, include excerpts from both the circuit court opinion and the Supreme Court opinion. So the main issue here on appeal was not whether the NLRB was correct or incorrect in the decision that these buyers were not managerial employees. The concern here is really um, not whether they made an incorrect determination, but whether uh, they did it the right way. In other words, the question here is not what the agency did or decided, but how they did it. The um, NLRB had reached its conclusion that these people were not managerial employees um, through this adjudication, and there, that meant that they could form their own union and force the employer to engage in collective bargaining. Um, and they had done the NLRB had done this through an adjudication, as I said, rather than through a rulemaking. Now, Bell Aerospace is the employer here, and they didn't want this particular group of workers to unionize. It was the workers who had petitioned the National Labor Relations Board for the right to come together and form a union so that they could bargain as a group over working conditions and benefits and uh, salaries and things like that with the managers. So the Bell Aerospace argued that if the NLRB wanted to adopt a position like this, 
um, on the, whether these types of workers are managerial, they should have used um, the Administrative Procedure Act rulemaking procedures like notice and comment rulemaking. They should have published a proposed rule in the Federal Register and had a public comment period and then proposed a final rule and so on. In other words, they argued that the NLRB could not simply declare such a broad general policy in the context of adjudicating an individual union petition. And um, so the NLRB argued that this was exactly what they're allowed to do under the Supreme Court's precedent, like the Chenery 2 case. That, um, and the main takeaway from Bell Aerospace is that the Supreme Court reversed the Second Circuit and reaffirmed its own Chenery 2 position, which remember was a much older case from the um, 1940s, that agencies can choose to make broad rule-like policy decisions in the context of adjudication rather than in a rulemaking. And if you think about it, this is what courts do, right? So when the Supreme Court decides to settle a question of statutory interpretation or, or constitutional law, um, they, it, it becomes the law. Their decision becomes the law and they announce it in that case. And the agency was essentially functioning like a specialized court in this sense. Not a, they, they're not Article Three judges, but they wanted to make uh, decisions on a case-by-case -case basis. But one, when they announced what the rule was, it was binding in that case and would be uh, presumably binding going forward. Now, the, court, uh, the Supreme Court noted that uh, Bell Aerospace hadn't shown any detrimental reliance on the agency's pos previous position against buyers being managerial. Remember one of the kind of side issues in this case is that the agency had previously said that these buyers are managers. And if you walked around the workplace, it might look like they're part of the management team. They're, uh, they, they work in the office, they uh, interact with the managers all day, go to meetings, and so forth, they're not working on the factory floor or in the warehouse or anything like that. And then the agency changed its mind. Um, and so Bell Aerospace was saying, that's not fair, that's a big change. And what if people had kind of been counting on the agency's previous position, if they are gonna make the change, it, they at least shouldn't do it in an adjudication over our workers wanting to unionize. They should announce that they're changing through notice and comment rulemaking. And the problem was that the, the, um, the employer, Bell, really didn't put any evidence in or brief the issue of how this hurt them, like how they, what, in what way they had relied to their own detriment on the agency's previous position. They were just saying that the change seemed like a, a big a change that could have caught people by surprise, but they couldn't show that the surprise had hurt anyone. Um, the court also noted near the end of the, its majority opinion that this is not an enforcement action, right? So um, Bell faced no fines or penalties from the NLRB. This is the only consequence of the court's decision here in reality is that a union can form for a few workers. It's not even their whole workforce. It's a certain type of worker, the purchasers or buyers at the company could engage in collective bargaining. And so maybe it would be harmless. Maybe the union would never get off the ground or, and maybe the, uh, the things that they negotiated for wouldn't be that uh, difficult for uh, the management. So it's not really clear that what harm Bell Aerospace is alleging here, except the sort of theoretical harm that some of their workers are going to have permission to form a union at this point if they want. I pulled out a quote from the case that I thought um, I, that I wanted to highlight for you because the court it, near the end of the opinion, there's a paragraph where they sort of discuss the pros and cons of uh, um, rulemaking versus adjudication. And they can see that there are advantages with traditional um, notice and comment rulemaking. So the court says, it is true, of course, that rulemaking would provide the board with a forum for soliciting the informed views of those affected in the industry and labor before embarking on a new course. But surely the board has discretion to decide that the adjudicative procedures in the case may also produce the relevant information necessary to mature, for mature and fair consideration of the issues. And those most immediately affected, that's the buyers in the company, 
um, in the particular case are accorded a full opportunity to be heard before the board makes its determination. And so what the court is saying here is there's a lot of benefits of doing notice and comment rulemaking, having a public comment period. It's true that the agency then can make a more informed decision because they can hear from experts, well-informed people from both sides, right? They, um, as it said, the, uh, the managers and the, the laborers can, uh, can submit public comments, could go to hearings, um, if there's public hearings and so forth, and then the agency could make a really well-informed decision. The court's not denying that there's advantages to that, but they are saying that here, the, um, they weren't just flying blind or make a, de a decision in the dark because the parties themselves had that opportunity at their hearing to submit articles and um, arguments and evidence and all sorts of stuff to convince um, the administrative law judge that their side was correct on this particular issue. So where does this leave us? Well, um, again, as we've seen in the, another case, agencies like the NLRB are permitted to announce new principles or policy approaches in an individual adjudicative proceeding. And the choice between uh, rulemaking and adjudication at the outset or initially lies within the agency's discretion. And that concludes our lecture about NLRB versus Bell Aerospace.